Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started here. My name is Deborah Gonzalez, and I'm the Government Affairs Director here at PPIC, um, the Public Policy Institute of California. And I want to thank you for joining us today. For those of you who don't know PPIC, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank with both offices in Sacramento and San Francisco. Sacramento rules, guys. We got the beer bread. It's the best. <laughs> For today's program, we're going to hear the main findings from a new report titled Improving College Pathways in California, authored by Nu Gao and Hans Johnson. Following the presentation, you'll hear from a great panel of experts on this topic. We'd like to thank Dirk and Charlene Capsonell Foundation, the Evelyn, Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund, the James Irvine Foundation, the Leona M. and Harry B. Helmsley Charitable Trust, and the Sutton Family Fund for their support of this important work. You should have received a copy of the report on your chair. There are additional copies in the back of the room if you would like to take some. The full report along with the slides are available now on our website at ppic.org. We'd also like to thank again the James Irvine Foundation and the Leona M. and Harry B. Helmsley Charitable Trust for making this event possible, including the lunch provided today. You should have received an agenda and all the speakers' bios on your chair. This will save us some time in terms of introductions. We have an illustrious panel, and we're very thankful that they made the time to come today. If there are any clarifying questions about the report, you'll have time, just a couple of them, um, after news presentation. But we'll also have times after the panel discussion for more questions and answers. A couple more things before we begin. Later today, you'll receive a survey. Um, via email, and we'd like you to take some time to fill that out. It does affect how we uh, present our presentations. And finally, please tell, turn off your cell phones. California's economy is the sixth largest in the world and is very dependent on a highly educated workforce. PPIC has produced a number of reports documenting that California faces a shortage of highly educated workers. Specifically, we found that 38% of all jobs will depend on workers with at least a bachelor's degree. But at the current rate of production, only 33% of workers will have one in 2030. This shortage has a significant impact for the continuing expansion of the California's economy. However, it's a more important fundamental question than that. California is a state of great wealth, but also has great poverty. Income inequality is gr a growing issue in California. Increasing the number of students who have earned a bachelor degree, and specifically underrepresented students who complete a bachelor degree, can begin to address this significant issue. How? This is for my dem my de demographers in the group, because they always lecture me on these kinds of things. <laughs> they tell me that workers with a bachelor's degree have higher labor force participation, lower unemployment rates, and higher wages than those without a degree. In fact, a recent PPIC blog pointed out that by 2015, the average annual wage for full-time year-round workers was more than twice as high for workers without a bachelor degree. There are significant issues here, and we're really glad we're able to work in this space. We know that the schools, both the K through 12 schools and the higher education institutions have been working on addressing some of these issues. And we hope this report helps build on those successes. With that, I'd like to introduce Nu Gao. She is a research fellow at PPIC, specializing in K through 12 education. Welcome, Nu. Thank you, everyone, for coming to our event today. Before we begin, we, we would like to acknowledge our funders and thank them for their generous support. Uh, I also noticed that April E. from the Irvine Foundation is able to uh, is here with us today. Hans and I, we benefit a lot from the conversations we had with April and her team. So we're really happy that she's here with us today. So now let's get started with the presentation. California's economy needs more highly educated workers. And across all demographic groups, both parents and, stu and students have very strong demand for college. But the reality is only a third of California's ninth graders are likely to earn a bachelor's degree. And of course, students are falling off the pathway at every stage, 
but the last two years of high school and the first two years of college is particularly important because most students fall off the pathways and these two points. And in this report, we use data from a variety of sources to examine students' pathway to and through college. So the set of questions we're interested in include when and where are students falling off the pathway and why. <coughs> so let's start with high school. And our high school sample includes about 140,000 high school graduates between 2007 and 2014 school years. And most students in our sample are low-income, first-generation students with very low test scores. So now, surprisingly, only 20% of the students in our sample completed the A2G requirements, which are a set of college prep courses students have to take if they want to get into UC or CSU. Statewide, the average was about 35% over the same time period. And now surprisingly, there is a very substantial achievement gap. And when and where, uh, when and where are these students falling off the A to D pathway? In terms of where, we find that math and English have the lowest completion rates compared to other subjects, such as social science or foreign language. And in terms of when, grades 11 and 12 are key exit points. So why is this happening? What we found is a very simple but very shocking problem, and that is the lack of progression among students. In math, the A to G sequence has three courses, Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. So students typically, took, students typically take those courses in that order. And in this figure, we show students' progression along the sequence. So for instance, among students who passed Algebra 1, only 66% only of them took geometry in later years. And similarly, among students who passed geometry, only 59% of them moved on to Algebra 2 in later years. And we also did the same exercise for high achieving students. So for instance, students who have passed the previous courses with an A or B. So these students are very high performing students. When you look at their um, progression, which are the dark bars, you know, they do slightly better, but still there's a very substantial progression problems. The progression problems really reflect a mismatch between student academic potential and their course taking patterns. The progression problem or the mismatch has very important equity implications. In this figure, we show the achievement gap in progression rates among the highest achieving group, which is the blue, blue line, and among the lowest achieving group, which is the orange line. And as you can see, when students first start, when they first start high school, the achievement gap was about 14 percentage point. But by the time students graduate from high school, the gap nearly doubles to 26 percentage points. In our report, we, all, we talked about a few institutional factors that, that might have contributed to the mismatch or the progression problems. Um, so you can refer to our report uh, to find more information. And now let's move on to college. Oh, also, in our report, we also talk about students' pathway to college. So for instance, which students get into which college? More information is included in our report. In today's presentation, we're going to look at a students' pathway through college. So uh, let's start with the community college. PBIC has done a lot of research on, on community college, and remediation, remediation education is one of the largest barriers to student success in community college. In our study, in our report, what we found is high school preparation is really important to address remediation in community college. So for instance, the number of A to D courses taken, grades in those A to D courses, and also highest level math courses taken in high school, they have a very great effect on reducing the need for, remedi for remediation in community college. And also the effects are larger for historically underrepresented students. In community college, but even among students who are well prepared, they, have, they face uh, additional barriers. And here we see a similar mismatch problems. In this figure, 
we show that about 20% overall, about 20% of students in our sample, they have very high probability of passing transfer level math or English courses, but they end up taking remediation courses. And you can see there's a very, uh, there's a significant variation across students, uh, across students groups. Moving on to CSU. So CSU, generally speaking, admits the top one third of high school students and the eligibility targets were set by the master plan, which was about 50, more than 50 years ago. And as K-12 schools improve its, uh, improves its A2G completion rate, we see that more and more students are, coming, are completing A2G requirements, meaning that they're eligible for CSU admission. But because of, capacity, because of capacity constraints, CSU was not able to take all of those eligible students. In this figure, we show the number of students who are turned away by CSU in the last four years. And you can see that the numbers are actually growing each year. So access is one of the barriers students face in CSU. Among students who, are, uh, among students who successfully enroll in CSU, Completion, or in other words, persistence, is one of the largest barriers. So in this figure, you can, you can see that way too many students dropped out of CSU before graduation. And, and African American students are much more likely to do so. And among students who dropped out of CSU, the, ma the vast majority of them did so in their first two years. So in conclusion, Persistence in the first two years is key to success in CSU. So why do students drop out, you may wonder. What we found is academic performance, for instance, GPA, is one of the most important indicator of CSU persistence. And uh, once again, high school preparation is really important to improve CSU persistence as well as CSU, uh, CSU GPA. <coughs> In terms of recommendation, we have, uh, we have a few big ones. So the first one, not every high school in California offers the full A to G sequence. And small schools and rural schools are much less likely to do so. So if we want to improve A to G completion, we need to make sure that schools increase the number of courses that are A to G approved. And second, in our report, we talked about the high school graduation requirements and how that might affect students' course taking patterns. And we also did a comparison of California's minimum requirements and how it compares to UC CSU expectations and also other states. What we found is the state's, the state's minimum policy is much less demanding than UC CSU expectation. And uh, it is also less demanding compared to other states. So for instance, California is one of the three states that only requires two years of math for high school graduation. And uh, similarly in English, California is, only, is one of the two states that only requires three years of English, where other states have required four years. So it is time for policymakers to update the high school graduation requirements. And in both high schools and in community, in both high schools and in community college, a much better placement system and a more effective course counseling and support system are very important to help students stay on track. So in high schools, policymakers could consider a potential simple nudge. So for instance, instead of having students opt into an A to G courses, policymakers could have students opt out of A to G courses. So a small nudge like this might have a big impact on students' A to G um, course takings. And uh, we should also point out that, you know, in each sector, there are a few reforms going on at the same time trying to address those issues. So for instance, in K-12, there was SB 359 trying to address math placement or displacement in ninth grade. And in community college, there is AB 705 trying to address remediation uh, in community college. And in CSU, there is the new graduation initiative, as well as the recent executive order trying to reform remediation and course support in, in, in CSU. So these reforms are all very important steps towards the, right step, uh, towards the right direction. And we need to monitor those reforms more closely. 
and uh, also to address the capacity issues and CSU, again, because the eligibility targets were set more than 50 years ago. Now the state economy is totally different. The K-12 pipeline is different as well. So it is time to rethink about the master plan, trying to make sure that all eligible students have access to college. And last, data is power and data is king. So we need a, a, we need a statewide longitudinal data, database so we can assess student performance and identify the gaps, design policy interventions, and evaluate those reforms more effectively and more accurately. So that concludes my um, presentation. Before I turn it over to Hans, uh, for the panel discussion, are there any clarification questions from the audience? Yes. I, I was confused with the statement about um, remedial education being a roadblock. Mm -hmm. Is that if there isn't enough remedial education being offered? The, the wording was ambiguous. Uh, so, uh, in community college, basically students enrolled in remediation courses have their low completion rate. So, the outcome is so uh, the, the, the completion rate is very low for those students enrolled in remediation. Any other questions? Great, thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Hans. Thank, thank you, New, and uh, thanks to all of you for uh, coming. We have a, a fantastic panel, and I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion. A lot of you I see are standing, but there are chairs um, uh, scattered throughout, so please feel free to climb over people to get in, into a chair. Uh, sorry, they are packed in, but there are, there are spaces available if you'd rather sit. Uh, so let me introduce the panel. Uh, the, the biographies are in your um, packet. Um, but let me quickly start. On my far right here is Jorge Aguilar. He is now the superintendent of the Sacramento City Unified School District. He also has experience in other segments, having come from UC Merced. Uh, and before that, he was at Fresno Unified. And then in the middle, we have Kimberly Rodriguez, who is the uh, uh, chief education advisor to Senator De Leon, who of course is the president pro tem of the California State Senate. And Kimberly knows everything from pre-K to entry into uh, the workforce, uh, community college, UC, CSU, and of course brings a legislative perspective on these topics. And then uh, finally, uh, to my immediate right here, we ha have uh, Jim uh, Dragna, who is the executive director of University Initiatives and Student Success. But I know him, and I think it's your semi-formal title of, uh, is as the uh, success czar or graduation czar <laughs> at, at, he has Russian connections apparently, so <laughs> be forewarned, uh, at Sacramento State University. So thank you very much, uh, panel members. Uh, before I begin uh, asking them questions, I'll ask them a set of questions and then we'll open it up to the audience and you'll have some time to ask uh, them some questions too. Uh, this report, of course, spans a long time frame, from ninth grade all the way through and to completing a bachelor's degree. Certainly there are many other kinds of completions we do care about. We've looked at certificates, for example, and associate degrees. Uh, we've done other work on that. That was not the focus of this report. And there are a lot of places where that pipeline is very leaky, uh, that pathway doesn't work. Um, so uh, the discussion can take a, a lot of different um, avenues here, and I think that's fine, but the way I'd like to frame this is, first of all, to, to focus on uh, the high school part of that pathway, uh, then move on to that transition to um, um, college. Uh, we focused in this report on community colleges and CSU because those are the largest sources of um, where students uh, end up in California. Uh, and then um, third, to uh, look at um, um, the, the, the higher ed university side of things, which could include, of course, also UC uh, and CSU, and certainly we're not bound by just the, 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 the topics that we took up in the report in this conversation. So the first uh, question, and I'm, I'm going to ask you, Jorge, to, to start off uh, answering this one, is in thinking about this, this pipeline overall, uh, we see large numbers of students who are um, not making it uh, through high school. First of all, high school dropout rates, although they're getting better, are still uh, higher than we'd like to see. And then A through C completion rates, which uh, are uh, a measure of college preparation among high school students in California, are going up. 
but they're still um, lower than, than we would like to see. So I'm wondering if you could talk um, from your K-12 perspective and your uh, high school perspective about some of the things that you've observed uh, and some of the initiatives that you've employed to try to improve those pathways. Thank you, Hans, and thank you to PPIC and everybody who's here today. Um, I mean, certainly, I mean, news presentation, um, there's a number of topics that, um, that we could talk about um, the entire afternoon, um, including the master plan and, 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 and the age of it. Um, but um, I'll, I will say that um, this particular topic does require um, a great set of sort of knowledge and skills around both um, K-12 and higher ed. Um, and to your question, Hans, um, the, the importance of understanding um, uh, the limitations that we have based on our inability to um, access information that is more personally identifiable um, uh, really has an impact on this topic in that um, the number of students that are taking A to G and completing the A to G course pattern, for example, um, can continue to go up, um, but without an ability to access information about how those students are doing once they enter higher ed and whether they persist or not, and then backtracking to see the variation in performance in the K-12 experience. Um, that is, um, what is the variation in performance uh, among students who complete the A to G course pattern um, among our high schools, um, among um, our departments, um, in certain AP uh, 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 courses um, as opposed to others, um, is, is, is why I think we're seeing um, more students complete the A to G course pattern uh, but without it having the kind of effect that we might expect uh, when it comes to issues of persistence. Um, now, the focus on A to G up until the new uh, California School Dashboard uh, really relied on um, superintendents who were committed to focus on A to G. Um, and, and, and that fundamental disconnect, I think, is one that we have to figure out how to, how to, how to find a, a stronger connection um, that is, K-12 and higher ed are not incentivized to focus on creating a stronger relationship between those that complete A to G and those that persist in higher education. Uh, as superintendent, there's nothing um, that incentivizes me to focus on not just increasing A to G completion rates, uh, but making sure that those that complete A to G completion also persist in higher ed. Um, and I can tell you from about half of my career having been spent at UC Merced that there is no incentive in higher ed to focus on working with K-12 to ensure that students who complete A to G also persist in higher education. Uh, and, and what I mean by incentive is funding-wise, uh, there is no incentive. Uh, uh, Recognition-wise, there is no incentive. Uh, uh, so those of us who have focused on that and have created a strong relationship are not rewarded with, with anything other than just going home at night and, and, and feeling proud about the work that, that we're doing in, in order to, to create these relationships that, that are just not, um, that are just not um, uh, 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 incentivized, if you will. And, and I think that's a topic that we really have to discuss. Um, otherwise, this, this is such a fundamental disconnect uh, between K-12 and higher ed that that I'm afraid that um, those of us who are focused on it just purely out of goodwill um, 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 uh, are, are going to continue to see these trends. So what, one of the findings that surprised us when we first started looking at the data, and I should thank uh, CalPASS Plus and Ed Results Partnership for working with us in providing the data and understanding uh, the strengths and, and the limitations of the data that we had to sample students. But we had a, 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 not a small share of students who were on this pathway in math or English, which was what we focused on in this presentation, but also in the report we have other uh, science uh, as well, and social science, but who had, who had taken the first one or two courses in the sequence in math, passed them, at, in, in not a few, not a small share of students, passing them with a grade of A or B, but never took the next one. And when we've gone out and kind of talked to people about our findings and got a qualitative, um, admittedly anecdotal responses, one thing we've heard is that, well, it wasn't required to take the next one to graduate from high school. 
or someone had talked to a counselor and the counselor said, oh, you're fine for high school graduation. You don't need to take the next one. Or in some cases, we saw students repeating a math course that they had already passed uh, rather than moving on to the next sequence. So I wonder if you have any reflections. Are those scheduling problems? Are they counseling problems? Are they all of the above? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, <clears throat> I think Michael Fullen uh, puts it best when he talks about uh, the difference between compliance and commitment. Um, that is, that um, we would like to think that we're in a field where there's enough committed individuals that would pre-register students to take courses in a sequential manner. Um, um, but uh, our master's schedules may not necessarily allow us to focus on, on that as, as some, something that we, uh, that, that we have as an objective. Um, so I'm not surprised by it. Um, I think news observation, and it's something that we did in Fresno and have begun to do in Sac City, and I see Mike Hansen, the former superintendent in Fresno, uh, where we spent almost a decade focused on this work, um, is we pre-registered students uh, to take uh, the entire battery of A to G courses. Uh, and that meant that we had to make fundamental cultural shifts in how master schedules were built. Um, and uh, master schedules are built in large part uh, based on your view of the world, right? Whether you see the world from an equity lens or you see the world from an equality lens. Um, and whether you think that your role is to serve students because you're committed or whether um, as, 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 as we did in Fresno, um, we, we said, you know, even if you're not committed, uh, we're gonna hold you to comply with uh, doing uh, the work that we're asking you to do. So we, we pre-registered students, and when they failed with a D or an F, um, we began building the master schedule for a summer school program where we pre-registered students for a summer school program, and we did give the option of students opting out. The first year that we did this, uh, we had served about 5,000 students through an opt-in philosophy where parents had to know when a flyer was going to be available, that you signed up for summer school, etc. Uh, when we pre-registered students who had a D or an F in any A to G course, and we built the master schedule around those data um, and those analytics, uh, the first year that we re, um, uh, repurposed our summer school program, we served 18,000 students. And we got 26 letters back filled out where the, where the parent or the guardian was opting their child out of summer school because we had pre-registered and we had said, you know, uh, we're, we're putting you in and you can always opt out. Um, um, I mean, so look, I mean, we, in, in, in urban ed today, and maybe for, for, for most of my lifetime, I don't think that we are going to have the capacity to create the demand um, around public policy uh, from parents to say, um, I demand that you put my child in a sequential level um, set of courses. So I will not tolerate um, that you put my child in Algebra 1, but you don't put them in Geometry. You put them in Geometry, but you don't put them in Algebra 2. That really is on us. Um, and until it's on us, or as long as it's on us, um, then I think it's going to be an issue of commitment versus compliance. And you know, um, we often told um, most of our adults in, in, in Fresno, and I'm doing it in Sac City, that, um, that I, I, I would love to have individuals that are committed um, and compliant, uh, but at times I have to accept that um, I may have individuals that uh, I just need to be compliant. Thank you. So, Kimberly, there's a lot here that you could respond to and think about. Certainly, I mean, this commitment versus compliance, that makes me think, is there a state role? So I'm very interested to hear what you might have to say about that. Certainly one of our recommendations was that the state increase uh, the math uh, requirement um, so that we're not one of the bottom states and maybe increase the English requirement for high school graduation so that we're not one of the, the states at, at the bottom with respect to those um, graduation requirements. Um, but there's also other intersegmental issues that we heard about. Um, no incentive for UC or maybe CSU to work with K-12, uh, although they do. Um, but I'm wondering if you could give us that legislative perspective as well as talking about some of these very uh, specific issues with respect to um, courses and graduation. Sure. So this whole issue of A through G being sort of the default curriculum is, is not new. It's been around in K-12 for a while. People have, many members have tried in my tenure to make it the default curriculum for high school graduation. Uh, the biggest barrier has always been money. 
because once you require it, the state is on the hook, the way the mandate system works for paying for that, right? So that has always been the biggest barrier. There's districts, very large districts in the state who have undergone this, the longest being San Jose Unified. And if you look back, LA has just recently done it. If you look back, there's been mixed reviews about how you do it and what the results have been for that. I think what um, Dr. Aguilar described was very much they looked at it from an infrastructure point of view, not just a not just a, uh, okay, let's do it and see what happens, right? There's a lot of planning and there's a lot of infrastructure that has to happen before you just turn on the switch and say, every kid's gonna graduate with an A through G curriculum. So unless you plan that, and unless a district really takes that on in the beginning, I think you're gonna have mixed results. In LA, you've seen a little bit of that because you've seen the, um, the online credit recovery really grow as part of that. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. There's been mixed reviews on whether having kids meet A through G online is really what the purpose of it was. So I think you have to be very careful when you do that. The rigor, no doubt, in having access to rigor for kids is that's research based, that's there. It needs to happen, but how you how you do it is very much, very much I think individualized to the district. So I don't know if the state has a role of saying everybody do it without giving them money to figure out how to do it, right? So there's that issue. The other issue on the intersegmental, I'll just say, um, giving my position, I'm in a unique position that I get to see all of it. So the K-12 part and the higher ed part, and that's really helped me. I think look at things. Um, it's very um, it's very illuminating because before I kind of get the sense that you all didn't talk to each other before <laughs> when I was on the K-12 part of it. Um, and I think now even there's a little bit of um, there's a little bit of uh, disconnection with the segments. I think there's there's more cooperation with the segments now, meaning UC, CSU, and community colleges than there probably ever has been. I still think the K-12 piece is lagging. Um, I think individual campuses like Sac State or other places across the state like Fresno and Merced and different places are doing things like locally, but I think from a system perspective, that's still very much lacking. And there's always, it's very difficult to incentivize with money because you have community colleges and K-12 and their lovely Prop 98 bubble, and you have everybody else on the general fund side, which is like, you know, fighting for scraps at the food table with everybody else. So it's very difficult um, to, to talk about money in that sense. Um, in terms of what I think our, the legislature has tried to do, I think we really have tried in a way, with LCFF, equities become sort of somewhat the focus in K-12, and I think there's a commitment and there's been a strong commitment for that. Whether or not that equity has 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 translated into this A through G conversation, I don't think that's happened yet, um, and I don't think it's happened on the career side probably yet either. And the K twelve people will argue because there's not enough money, but it's very difficult to make that argument when the rest of the budget's seeing less and they're seeing a bunch more. <laughs> so I think there there's all that kind of dichotomy going around. But we've tried, I think, in the legislature to try to make college. Um, make college and career uh, a priority. We offered $200 million in one-time money a couple years ago for that purpose. It's one time. It's very difficult to get ongoing with LCFF around. Um, but I think on the K-12 and on the higher ed side, it's all about, it's trying to get completion and once you get kids in there. And the systems are doing things like with CSU with their remediation and the developmental education. That's a huge thing. Um, and I think community colleges are like a petri dish of what you know, between remedial education, placement, and guided pathways, and all that stuff. It's all good things, but we haven't seen the fruit of it yet. And even UC, with UC, we did a program a couple years ago trying to get them to recognize there's LCFF. To be honest, and this is not a slight against UC at all, but when we went to them, they were like, what's LCFF? <laughs> um, and so that is just a lack of knowledge, kind of, to know That's that... the local control funding for yeah, those exactly. of you who don't know. But what does it do? <laughs> it, gives, it, it emphasizes more on low-income um, English learner and foster youth kids. So how can you leverage that from a, from a system perspective at the University of California to work with K-12 on that? And so we tried to incentivize that. But it's more of that stuff that needs to happen, I think. Right. And I, I think it's important, you know, um, in fact, I'm going to turn, if, if, if uh, those of you who have a report, turn to 
page five of the report in figure one, we have a flow chart of that ninth grade to, to college completion. And um, one part of, of what we also observed was what we call an access issue. Um, uh, Kimberly, uh, you know uh, that there was an eligibility study done recently. So that's the share of students, high school students who are meeting the eligibility criteria for UC and CSU. I uh, see we have Kathleen Chavira here too from CSU. Um, and it found that actually right now about 40% of California high school graduates are meeting CSU eligibility criteria even though the master plan ideal is one third. Our position at PPIC, we're non-advocacy, we're research-based, is that that's a good thing that students are doing better um, and that we should try to find ways to accommodate those students. Um, and I know there's some debate about how many really need to be accommodated, whether they're going elsewhere, the ones who are there's this category called denied eligible, which is you're eligible for CSU, but you were denied because you applied to a campus that is impacted, doesn't have room for everyone who's, who's eligible. Uh, so I'm wondering where the legislature is on that. That comes down to funding, I think, uh, conversations a lot of time. Um, but also, if we're successful, if uh, Jorge is successful at Sac City, as he has been in past in the Fresno and other uh, places, uh, Sac State, uh, we'll, and we'll hear from you in a minute, Jim, uh, is successful in, in their graduation initiatives. Uh, the, the number of students that we're talking about here, this community college reforms, uh, guided pathways, and um, improving um, pathways so fewer students go into developmental education and those who do, also known as remedial education, those who do graduate or uh, succeed uh, at higher rates. Um, we could have a tidal wave of additional students who might be looking for admission to UC and CSU either directly from high school or as transfer students from community colleges. So what's happening in the legislature when we're talking about these enrollment pressures? Well, I think over the last three years, we have enrolled between CSU and UC. We have provided money to the segments for over 20,000 more California resident students over, over the last three years. Um, which we did provide funding for, ongoing funding. Um, I think that the ultimate, the issue comes down to money, really, um, in terms of, unless we're just going to tell the system you have to take kids with what we give you and without an increase, which is not, in, in our caucus, is not exactly fair, the, the way we think. So it does come down to money for that issue. Um, it also comes down to, I think, the, the universities have done a a good job of taking kids and finding a place where, but there's other issues, not just enrolling them. There's where you're going to house them, right? That's a big issue, and housing is a huge issue across California, not just in the university space, but in the state space, right? And that exacerbates the problem. Um, so there's a lot of other issues that we have to think about. But again, higher ed is on the general fund side of the budget, which is not easy. Mm -hmm. the, gro the most growing costs are with health care and human services, and that is Everybody talks about prisons and that kind of thing. It's really health and human services that's the fastest growing. And whatever happens in Washington with health care could have a huge effect on our budget. And higher ed operates in that space. So that is what we're competing with in terms of, of money. Um, and the universities, uh, CSU will tell you and UC will tell you, you know, they come to us with an ask that's way more than what the governor provides them every January. And you know our members, if they had their way, they would do it all, but we can't. And so that's what it generally comes down to with enrollment. Thanks. So um, Jim, finally, uh, we get to kind of the university side here. And I know there's a, a tremendous number of programs happening throughout the California State University system to improve <laughs> graduation rates. Uh, currently, I think the six-year graduation rate of incoming freshmen graduating within six years is about 57% or so. Um, I think Sacramento State might be a little lower than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've come to Sacramento uh, State University from a very geographically eclectic background, which includes North Dakota, Florida, and New Zealand. <laughs> it's probably the only person in Sacramento who has that background. <laughs> I'm sure it suits you well. Um, but I'm wondering uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about what Sacramento State University is doing to improve uh, graduation and on-time graduation. And, and how you're working with uh, these, um, your local partners, the community colleges and the K-12 sector, um, which includes, of course, Sac City uh, Unified on uh, improving uh, this pathway and having fewer students um, drop out of these key transition points. Well, I as well thank you, um, everyone for having the opportunity to talk with you today, especially PPIC. 
Um, perhaps because of the geographic relocations that I've done over time, I have a great deal of passion for this work and working on helping students be successful. My background also includes the fact that I'm a licensed psychologist and I, my background was working with um, adolescents and young adults. And some of the similar problems that I've seen in other places are here, obviously, as well. With one exception, and uh, this probably comes more from my work in New Zealand than anywhere else, in that those stated problems um, that we're addressing in terms of student progression um, to graduation um, have been with us so long, especially at Sacramento State for about 30 years as we've recorded this, um, that they've become part of the culture, if you will, and have really required us to look not just simply at programs that might be effective, but about how to transform cultures and how to do that because of this graduation initiative in a very tight um, time span. We want students to be able to graduate in four years or in six years or at, at all, um, and we want that rate to improve now. And this is a part of my work um, dealing uh, not only in the statistics of all this and working with programs and processes, but also I think at a fundamental moral issue as well. Right now at Sacramento State, if I were to have 10 incoming students sitting in a row and I would um, literally say to them, unlike maybe some of you had, look to your right and look to your left, one of you are not going to make it in four years, <laughs> um, I would literally have to say, look at the 10 people at this row, only two of them will graduate in four years at Sacramento State. Uh, that's an unfair expectation and I think that's an unfair promise. So there's an incentive here that has to do with moral obligation as well. Over a six-year period, we're just barely graduating 50% of our students at Sac State. And with that type of information, I think it's very hard for students, faculty, um, for um, staff, as well as community members to kind of turn away and deny that those facts are actually there. We haven't had a jump in our four-year graduation rate from 8% um, in, the, in the last 30 years. No matter all the programs that we've applied, all the monies have been applied to this. This last year, um, we had a jump of 4%, I mean, excuse me, four points, which basically means that we had a 50% increase in our four-year graduation rate in one year. We're on the right path, we think. We're actually seeing a great deal of improvement across all of our um, students. And probably the best one that I can describe to you is one we've received a lot of national reputation for, and that's our Finish in Four program. Our Finish in Four program is simply a pledge. It's asking our students coming into the university to pledge that they will graduate in, in four years. And for that, we offer them additional advising. We offer them incentives to take summer courses. We give them $1,000 credit for a summer course that they would take. Um, and we also uh, literally have a call out that goes on continually where we call students and ask them a motivational interviewing type question. What's preventing you from taking those courses right now that help you to graduate in four years? Well, one of the things we know that if students pledge to graduate in four years and they don't finish in four years, they actually have a 20% increase in their six-year graduation rate as well. So it's about graduation rates, or as we say, on-time graduation rates. For that program, back in uh, 2012, as a time when we didn't have the program or even semblance of such a program, we had about 25% of our first-year students coming from high school take 15 credit hours. Well, if you do the math, you know you have to take 15 credit hours in order to graduate in four years. Only 20% or 25% actually took 15 credit hours in that first semester. The first year, which was two years ago that we tried to finish in four, by just simply educating students about its advantages in terms of how much advantage you have to graduate, improving grade point average, the economic benefit, the savings that you have, um, and literally working within a cohort more exactingly, we had 60% of our students sign up to take uh, 15 hours in their first semester. This year in our summer orientation, we went through the same message again. We just got a little bit better at it. And now we have 84% of our students take 15 hours. What did we do differently? What we did was we tackled the culture. Students just didn't put that together that what they took in high school, what they took in elementary school, aligns very closely with an ultimate end, which is success in life. 
not success in the universities. Texas recently did a, a, a nice bit of work in looking at students who are in charter schools and really emphasizing having students who leave charter schools in, in high school to move on to college. They were looking at some schools reaching up to 100% of placement in college. That's fantastic. I happened to be able to sit at one, in the back of the room in one of these issues, and I was just curious. And once they get to college, what is their success rate? And they were looking about 17%. The issue here, again, is not to fall into that false promise that if you work really hard, automatically you'll be prepared for college. Um, the universities, and I, I would suggest what you're saying as well, have not really got across the message that this is a developmental process. We at the university, at Sacramento State University, are now saying that our first year students are kindergartners. Okay? How do we take them across that developmental pathway all the way through the process and not just arrive at university as if we're some magnificent uh, temple on the mountain, but simply a next step for development? and helping that student see the university as literally an Uber ride, if you will, to get you to success in life, okay? We're part of the same team. And to do that, we've really emphasized working with counselors um, at the elementary level, at the secondary level, with community college. We have been working very um, heavily and looking at an economic system, uh, excuse me, an ecology of technology system that allows us to plot where we're going. We're very proud of the work we're doing in um, predictive analysis, which is basically a way of looking at pathways students have taken and literally giving them, students as well as faculty and staff, an ob an, a, a real clear view of what is the probability of that student to get a grade in the next class, in the next algebra class. If they've got a C in one class, what will be their next class by probability? Make that forward looking and be able to get that information into the student's hands and more importantly, get that information into the, um, uh, the parents as well and faculty and staff. And what has happened as a result of that? Well, if you see the clever way we did this, but I think it was more just synchronicity of timing to be understanding, we started a pipeline we changed the culture, and who started the culture of change? The ones that are easiest to change the culture, and that's the students themselves. The students are now asking for those additional courses. They're asking for the time to take those courses. They're literally working with the faculty to open that up. At the university, we've last year, we opened off 12,500 new seats for those students so that they could find the classes they need. Um, we offered additional sections of those courses, and now we're working math pathways as well uh, so that students don't have to take remediation anymore, that we can teach math developmentally, pick up the students from where they were, and carry them forward to the next um, direction. What the report says is quite accurate, especially in terms of our high-risk students are their first two-year students, where we lose um, a significant amount of those students are going to be lost along the way. And we're doing this type of intervention to take a big university and make it a very personal university. And that's been very helpful with call-outs, intrusive advising, looking at this probability factor, and more importantly, something that all of us are dedicated to, and that is the fact if you educate people, they get it, they understand it, and they'll become that, as opposed to try to force them with some type of um, choice. So we're excited about the direction we're moving with and moving with people like this on the panel who really see that that course of direction starts very early in the process. Yeah, Hans, I will just, just as a comment or a side note, um, I visited two districts this, this fall um, for three days in each. And at both places I was at, at middle and sometimes elementary school, there was college everywhere. And these were low-income kids, underrepresented kids, and they would tell us, because we would talk to them, they had to write essays about this is where I want to go and this is why. But to start that at that age and not, these weren't high school kids, these were again middle and elementary kids. That's a culture issue. And so that's a very huge culture issue that needs to happen in more places often than it doesn't, right? Particularly in those areas of the state and in those neighborhoods. So a couple of months ago, PPIC released a report looking at pathways to college from a regional perspective. We focused on the Inland Empire, the uh, San Joaquin Valley, and, and Los Angeles County. And one item we heard consistently from the people that we were talking to 
uh, and there were a lot of interventions, a lot of new programs being developed, was they didn't have the data connections they needed to understand what was working and what wasn't working. So partly this is a self-serving <laughs> policy researcher <laughs> question, uh, but I'd like any or all of you to respond to it is, um, how do you use uh, data? Uh, from our perspective, a statewide longitudinal database that follows uh, students um, from kindergarten all the way through our college and actually into the early years of the workforce would be the best kind of data system to, to produce. Um, and that, that would actually help regional uh, efforts that are underway already, as well as perhaps even being able to help um, districts themselves. And I know, Jorge, you've used data a lot. Uh, Jim, you already talked about some of the things that you're doing with respect to data within your own system. Kimberly, I know this kind of cross-segmental data system is something that the legislature has been interested in. Um, where are we going with that, and, and, and what can we expect, and, and, and is data a part of the solution, and, and a relatively cheap one compared to some other parts of the solution? Well, I mean, let me just preface by saying it's a, always a catch-22 to talk about um, some of the stuff that we've done, because um, in retrospect, um, it feels like um, some of it was very easy and some of it was very difficult. Um, so, of course, I, I, I think we would benefit from a longitudinal system. Um, without it, um, I think the challenge is one where everything is possible in terms of sharing data. And, um, and what we did in Fresno and have begun to do in Sac City um, uh, did result in um, UC Merced, Fresno State, the State Center Community College District, and Fresno Unified signing an MOU uh, that unfortunately took almost a year to uh, get through all of the different legal councils, uh, but we were very persistent, driven by, um, by K-12, um, and eventually uh, began to share data where our counselors were able to understand which of our students in Fresno Unified um, had applied to Fresno State uh, on a daily basis. Um, so we weren't having to ask our students whether they had applied or applied to UC Merced or the State Center Community College District, all the way into whether they had registered for orientation or not, whether they had paid their fees, whether they were still missing a financial aid document, et cetera. And that's how we increased the number of our students. Uh, for example, at Fresno State, uh, when we started this work, there were 900 applicants to Fresno State. Last year, we had over 2,000 um, students who applied to Fresno State. Um, and we've begun to do uh, the same work in Sac City. In fact, um, we're scheduling a press conference to sign an MOU between Sac City, Sac State, um, um, and Los Rios Community College um, next month. Um, so I say that because it, 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 it is hard, but it's easy at the same time in that it's possible. Um, um, and, and, and I think that my fear is that then people say, well, you see, people are doing it, so everybody should do it. The challenge is that um, in doing it, um, you rely greatly on goodwill. And, and you can't scale goodwill. I mean, goodwill is very temporary, right? Uh, and it just happens that at the moment, and I hope for my entire career, um, uh, President Nelson, Chancellor King, and I are getting along wonderfully. <laughs> um, as um, President Castro uh, and I had worked at UC Merced together, um, and we just hired a chancellor. I was on loan at Fresno Unified from UC Merced, and we had um, a great leader in my Hansen at Fresno State. And so we capitalized on the goodwill to advance this work. But you cannot scale goodwill. And, and this work then has, I mean, is, 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 um, uh, can be the victim, if you will, of, of, of when goodwill doesn't exist. And so um, on the one hand, you don't want the work to rely on goodwill. And I'm not suggesting that it needs to rely and depend on legislation either. But there's got to be a balance that we have to come up uh, with as, 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 as individuals that deeply care about this topic. And, and I'm not sure what, where that balance is going to be, except to say that where we've done it and, and, and will continue to do it, we're still relying on goodwill. And, and, and my worry is that 
um, where, where there's an over-reliance of goodwill, um, um, you can sign MOUs and then nothing happens. Um, and so uh, I feel very fortunate that here in Sacramento, we have uh, very committed leaders in President Nelson and in Chancellor King, and that we will advance the work and that I hope uh, we can systematize uh, the effort in a way that it outlives us and, and eventually doesn't rely on goodwill. Um, but, but I think that's, that's really a public policy question that we have to address pretty soon, that uh, these, are, these are pockets of excellence um, that, 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 that rely on goodwill. And, and I just fear that you can't scale it. Kimberly, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> sure. Um, well, there's a couple of things I'll say. First is the state doesn't have a huge, the best track record in building statewide data systems. I mean, that's a fact. Um, fiscal, you can, we can go on and on about this in terms of state procurement of that situation. But I will say that data is so necessary in terms of cross-segmental what Dr. Aguilar is talking about. And I would also add in a workforce element from the workforce agency. It's very, it's very important in that respect, too. Um, and, you know, the legislature wants data. We ask for it all the time and, you know, often told we were like, well, we can't get that because we don't collect it or, or whatever. I think we're at a, a certain crossroads um, in terms of this issue for a couple of reasons. Um, one, you know, we're at the K-12 level, we're going to have, we have a data dashboard now, which is more data than K-12 has ever sort of relied on before. It's always been a test score. Now we have different inputs, theoretically, that are at the state level and also at the local level that I think we can tap into. Two, um, I think there's an opportunity in the next two years, two to three years, to talk about a coordinating body for higher ed in terms of um, the segments and how, and I really don't want to lose K-12 as part of that discussion because they need to be part of that. Necessarily all of the requirements or duties of a coordinating body, but in terms of data, they need to be part of that discussion. So does the workforce agency, which in my opinion, and they are the hardest people to get on board in terms of data and for, and for higher. And, for, and financial aid too. Yeah, and financial aid for, yeah. for higher, for just for education purposes in general. Um, we always like this thing out there that they all just want to operate on their island and we've tried to force them to be together with the community colleges, which is still a work in progress. But that all together, I think those are the two opportunities that we have to really harness what is going on in K-12 and potentially what could happen with a, K with a coordinating body that we as a state should take advantage of, given and recognize that, you know, we're always not the best people for the technology part of it, but hopefully that can be overcome in terms of how that works. Fantastic, thanks. So I'd like to uh, turn to audience questions. And there are a couple mics, so please wait for the mic and just uh, tell us your name and your affiliation uh, and then make your question uh, as brief as possible so we can get to everybody's questions. Thank you. Hi, Alana Matthews and I am chair of the Florin Law Academy and I'm just wondering, um, have you all thought about duplicating the success of the Career uh, Pathway Academy? So the Law Academy encourages students to become lawyers. So they take those A through G requirements and there's a two, two, three so two years community college, two years at college, three years at law school to help keep those students on track. Well, I'll, I'll just um, say I was uh, yesterday at Luther Burbank um, High School, uh, which is one of our uh, comprehensive high schools, and we do have a law and social justice academy. Um, and one of the questions that I get asked often, and I know that um, uh, Mike Hansen gets um, asked often, is whether we had the success that we had in Fresno because we had and implemented a default A to G curriculum. And the fact is, we never did. Um, and we were very intentional in saying that we weren't interested um, because we did want to see um, uh, these, um, uh, at least, um, uh, bef you know, before our partnership, uh, you know, the CTE, vocational ed, and A to G pathways treated as mutually exclusive ones. Um, and given my experience at UC Merced, um, I knew that uh, we were having to move toward a more inclusive um, um, uh, set of policies that brought, brought more CTE programming into A to G courses. Um, so what we did instead was, um, was uh, build more robust um, CTE pathways. Um, and again, from a master scheduling perspective, 
um, learned uh, that we had to be impatiently patient, uh, in some cases waiting for uh, teachers to retire who were overseeing pathways that we could just never uh, make more robust. Um, nor, nor, nor would they ever uh, receive A to G certification either. Um, but, uh, but that's the reason why we never went with a default A to G curriculum, because we thought that our success would come from building more robust um, CTE pathways, uh, like the one that you described. Um, and we were really uh, tentative and hesitant about sending a signal um, right as uh, link learning and other uh, comprehensive CTE pathways were, were, were very embryonic, sending a signal that we were uh, more interested in A to G, um, which, you know, I mean, I've said publicly many times, if I could change um, how we refer to the set of courses that, um, that are necessary to become eligible, I mean, it was A to F when I was younger and now A to G, um, I mean, the, the reality is, um, we, we still suffer from um, A to G being uh, associated only with college. Um, and, um, and I think that's, that, that's hurtful. Um, but we have proven, and many, many school districts have proven, that you can have very robust CTE pathways that, in effect, are also A to G default uh, pathways. Can I just um, add to that and combine t two um, questions we've addressed, um, at least attempted to? Um, one of the things that's magnificent in terms of the technology and looking at more of a structured scheduling or pathways, those type of issues, is that um, it's my feeling from looking and working around the country um, that California is way behind in this area. So there's a real advantage here just kind of jumping over a couple of iterations and just going to the future. Um, with that in mind, we have a smart planner basically. It's a software that allows students to um, see all the possible schedules they could have um, that actually allows them to move through to graduation. Um, and then they can filter it by maybe they can't work, they're working on a Monday morning, can't have a class, et cetera, and it gives them to a best type of schedule for them. It makes perfect sense, and we're working with Los Rios right now, to take that smart planner and put it at the beginning of a community college, for instance, and to populate with that, and then to offer a guarantee to students that if they stay with that, they'll have that class two years from now or three years from now, and just m move through that um, seamlessly. I mean, it, it just makes sense. The technology's there. Now, I say that, and here's the dark side. I, as we're talking right now, I have two of our staff people who are literally taking high school transcripts from students who have applied to Sac State, and they're converting them to electronic copies. Can you imagine that? We don't even have electronic copies of transcripts when we talk looking at grades as predictors and all those type of things. And what it, actually, what does a community college have in terms of a transcript? And, and some of you know the answer to that. Um, so, yeah, right. So we're, we're far back in some ways. And currently, we're having discussions with others to literally skip a step of predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics. And literally, why don't we just move to artificial intelligence? Okay. Why, and truthfully, I mean this, why can't a student talk in, to Siri and say, I'm thinking about taking this major, what are my best courses? It would have it downloaded there. It would say which ones give you the high probability of success based on your history, what type of advising you need to take, and why not do it as well? Why don't they schedule the class, which they can do right now on Siri if they wanted to, and then add to it, draw money from their bank so they can pay for the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're moving to, plan. so that advisors can advise and teachers can teach, and we can take these things that should be a system and make them into a system that really is automatic. So, so I should put a note in, too, that the community colleges are not using AI, at least as far as I know, but have implemented uh, a new guided pathways um, project, which is designed to let students know what they need to do to reach their goals. Uh, and part of that, and Kimberly, you might want to add on to this, but part of that was this experience that a lot of students were having and that colleges were observing. The students had so many choices but without any sort of clear definition about what those choices would lead to. So your program clearly is designed uh, for a legal kind of outcome, which sounds fantastic, 
But there are, of course, students who are interested in many different other kinds of outcomes. And one of the challenges has been to take this wide set of courses and options and majors and uh, work with students so that they can have a more directed path. Yeah. I mean, I think the guided pathways, we've invested $150 million the first round. We'll see what goes with that. But the idea of you know, a student to know what they need to take. And I, you know, I agree with, um, with Jim in terms of I visited, well, a couple years ago we went to the grad initiative um, symposium and I think it was, I think it was Cal Poly. Cal Poly has an app for their students that the students can, they log on and see, there's like a little time or a little clock. It looks like a clock, but it's really probably like, you know, an arrow that moves. This is how far I am to, completing my degree and this is what I need to do and they look and all the data is updated every day and so for students to have that access on that app is huge for them because it's a constant it's just like another app that they play with right so um, so that kind of thing I agree that you know the technology is where students are in terms of I mean, they need guidance about what to do to get them out particularly at the community college level because they can languish there for a long time and it's expensive, even though it's the cheapest in the country, but the longer you're there, it adds up mm -hmm. um, for them. Thanks. Other questions? So we have here, we have a mic up here. Hello, my name is Annalie Madrano, and I'm with U.S. Senator Kamala Harris's office, but I'm going to take that hat off and talk as a student at Sac State. So as a student, and I've seen a lot of my peers have issues when they're getting into a full-time job to meet that um, two-year um, graduation rate. And so what are we doing to make sure that if we have students that have dropped out or wasn't able to finish their academic goal because they went into a career to go back to school and um, accommodate their office hours? It's a good question, and, and it's one that I have um, a real uh, um, interest in because when we look at our four-year graduation rate, um, we're looking at the year by 2025 of getting somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of our students to being able to graduate in four years. Uh, so the majority of our students will always be those students who are probably taking longer that because of part-time obligations or skills. Interesting enough, we opened up all these classrooms and offered more options for students in order to take courses this last two years. Um, and what we found in, in surveying our students and asking them and in intrusive advising and other concerns, uh, what is your number one issue? Um, it moved away from not being able to get classes to, to financial obligation. Um, and that's true for many of the CSUs. Um, a couple of things we're trying to do, um, and again, you're very much right when you say when this is stateside, the money's hard coming. Uh, so one of the things we did, as I mentioned, we um, really tried to open up the summer session and offered um, um, incentives for students to do that. So basically, a student who takes a some, one three-hour class in the summer now is basically not paying any money at all for that, and that gives them a chance to be a little bit more flexible. The other thing we're doing is we're plotting and mapping our, our courses as well to see when students actually need courses and giving them the opportunity to say, this course will be available to you next summer or something of that nature and try to fluctuate the timing of those so that students can look at their schedule over more of a four-year commitment than looking at whatever's coming up in the next semester. And for our summer, it used to be a couple of weeks before the semester started, we'd figure out what was needed. Um, our, our faculty have been very effective with that as well. We actually now have Friday afternoon classes. Um, um, people, people remark about when they come to campus on Fridays, it looks like uh, any other day um, because they're opening up their schedules, they're opening up that so that students can work around that. Um, we're looking at summer now as a possibility of offering incentives for housing as well um, so that if we offer students this and they don't do well in a class, for instance, they can still set, stay in that sequence, if you will, by going back and recovering uh, that three hours or, or more. And our president especially is um, actually enthusiastic and passionate about trying to find alternative funding sources for students, in, increase in scholarships, increase in, in, in jobs on campus as well, um, that I think will have um, great effect. One of the best things we've done to give you an idea with this is our social work program came to us 
and that's where the best ideas come from many times when people are actually working with it, and said that um, we would really like to offer, for many of our students, it would be better to graduate in three years than four years, but we'd have to use the summer. Can you offer some incentives? And we offered those students free classes in the summer in order to pick that up. So we had um, 30 students attempt this this last year. Uh, almost all of those students were working as well. Um, and we had 29 of them finish in three years out of 30. Uh, these type of structured scheduling that accelerates the time, that actually makes the coursework harder, have been shown over and over again nationally. When you raise the benchmark and what's required, you actually raise the graduation rates as well. Those are some of the things we're doing, but I, I agree with you, that's the harder, um, that's the harder issue to, to for fully resolve. The best we can do is help individual students manage that with flexible scheduling. In the back, you've been patient. Um, <clears throat> you had um, mentioned the Graduate in Four program and its immediate success going up four points uh, from eight to 12. Um, have you shared that program or has it gone to other CSUs? Yes, we have a number of schools that um, are using it. It's actually um, a national program. It has a lot of um, backing from um, organizations like um, Complete College America and other ones. All of them show a very strong um, um, progress. We happen to show even more progress, and some of that might just be the numbers, that our numbers are so low, they're artificially low. And as my grandmother said, at least you can't fall out of a hole. And we are learning, <laughs> we are learning about the effects of, of this. Um, another interesting point about that, if you kind of see, if we start with an incoming freshman, those first year students, we have the highest rates ever we've had to students um, who are moving towards sophomore year. We've actually increased our retention rate by 5% between first and second year. We never thought that would happen. We thought that would be a casualty, that students would kind of fall out because it was too much work to do. They're doing it very well. But the finishing four also has another aspect, and that is we called all students that were approaching graduation, um, or within 30 hours of graduating, and we called them and said, basically, what can we do to help you to graduate on time? What is it that you need? We asked about jobs. We asked about other type of finances. We asked about what courses you needed when you needed them. And so if you see, to change that all in one year, it was those students who finished early that actually raised our graduation rate. The pipeline is so high now that if we just really just move forward as we have in the past, We'll meet our graduation rates by 2025. We'll, we'll meet them in three years from now. Um, so the answer is yes, we do share it a lot, and we gain on, on how other people are doing it as well. So I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative here and just ask a, a question of, of Jorge. And that is one of the areas where we see students, and I know this is a big issue at, at, at SAC uh, City Unified, is uh, students who don't finish, who, who don't graduate. Um, so the corollary there is, you know, CSU tries to find ways to engage them maybe in non-traditional um, times. H how are you or how have you in the past addressed um, problems with dropout, which is also clearly a an equity issue as well? Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, you know, um, one of the first things that, that we did uh, on July 1 when I started in Sac City is we uh, did a comprehensive um, data analysis of, um, I obviously wasn't here when we built the master schedule for this academic year. Um, and um, we basically measured um, how much we could stretch that master schedule and still be within our collective bargaining agreement with our, with our teachers, of course. Um, but we identified um, between August 21, we started on August 31st this year, August 21 and September 15th, um, we shifted schedules, uh, student schedules, mind you, they had been already set based on the master schedule the previous uh, spring semester. Um, and we stretched uh, our master schedule to its capacity um, before we looked into credit recovery uh, for some of the reasons that you mentioned, Kimberly. Um, and we um, increased the number of students that were back on track for graduation and or A to G by 202 students through this opt-out philosophy. I mean, students weren't even here. Um, and in a three-week period, um, shifted schedules still within the master scheduling capacity 
uh, by 202 students. Um, none of the parents or guardians of the 202 students came to a board meeting and made that demand. Right? And these were students that were missing one year of visual performing arts, a second year of language other than English, um, had gotten a D in their 10th grade year and never repeated it. Um, I mean, very simple um, exercises of commitment to a vision that students should have an equal opportunity to graduate with the greatest number of post-secondary choices from the widest array of options. I mean, that's, that is the vision that we have adopted in Sacramento City Unified, that irrespective of parent levels of empowerment or advocacy or comfort in navigating a complex system, whether it's K-12 or higher ed, um, these are very complex systems, um, that these are the actions that we owe to our students. Um, and, uh, and we're very proud that 202 students are now on track uh, without any of them making those demands of us. Um, and so, I mean, you know, the, the heart of, of, of a lot of what I've been describing does come down to our commitment to a master schedule that um, advances that particular vision. Um, and let me just say, um, and I'll, I'll stop talking here. Um, from a public policy perspective, Kimberly mentioned the California School Dashboard. Um, and we were fortunate to be on the superintendent's task force um, uh, when, when, when it was, when it was um, built. Um, it, from a pub public policy standpoint, one thing that I think we need to monitor very closely is uh, the college and career readiness metric of the California School Dashboard has several ways in which a student can, 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 can reach college, college and career readiness, uh, the college and career readiness standard. Um, again, it's a combination of them. So you can complete A to G, you can do a career pathway, you can take an AP test. There's just a number. We have to spend a great deal of time studying how it is that schools are going to demonstrate that their students are college and career ready. That is, um, it, it will be of no, of no use, I think, from a public policy standpoint, if I operate a school that has a very high percentage of our students who are already taking AP courses. And that's how our students become college and career ready. Right? I mean, I didn't change anything fundamentally, but I'm going to be rewarded for having a high percentage of students that are college and career ready. But I already have a school that operates that way, right? I mean, we didn't shift any, anything culturally. Um, just as I might have a school that has the highest percentage of students who complete A to G. I mean, there's nothing that I will do fundamentally different, and yet I will be rewarded with a blue or a green uh, because a lot of my students are completing A to G, right? Sure. What we have to monitor, I think, you know, PPIC and others, and I always, um, you know, am, am fond of colleagueships of expertise, and I enjoy working with, with researchers, is we have to monitor how it is and whether or not there's going to be significant shifts in whether students meet college and career readiness standards because we fundamentally have done something different. Right. Well, and I would add to Dr. Aguilar is who those students are. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Because, you know, I visited Huntington Beach, and I've said this before, where there's like, there was 31 AP courses. I was blown away. Yeah. And you go to the east side of LA or you go to Fresno, you're not going to find that there. And it's not that the students can't compete or can't, can't do the work. It's that they don't have an opportunity for that kind of work that they can take. And so that is what needs to be. That's the heart of equity, mm -hmm. right? That's yep. what needs to be discussed. Okay. So we have time for one more question, right here. Hello, so my question is thinking about what's happening at the national level with Trump and DeVos kind of steering people away from higher education saying we need technical training and what's been happening with that tax uh, budget kind of sticking it to students. And also looking at California, um, it was the PPIC poll that shows that while Californians believe that higher education is necessary for the economic vitality of California, people also don't believe that that's the only way to succeed. So with those things in mind, like what do we need to do as a state to ensure that students still see college as a means for uh, economic mobility? 
I had easier questions too, so I can ask <laughs> those. No, so uh, uh, I think I think it's a culture issue that you have to start like what I talked about in terms of middle and elementary school that it's an it's an option, and you know I agree with with the panelists in terms of there's got to be other opportunities for students, and if you look at the fastest growing jobs in the state, they're in the clean energy space, um, and they're they're technical, right? So. That's where community colleges come in in terms of workforce, and and yes, you can get a, a a better paying job from doing that. So that has to be part of that conversation. But I do think financial aid is part of that because no matter what, whether you get a BA, you're going to need some more technical, some more more education than just a high school diploma to get a decent job. It doesn't necessarily have to be a BA, but it's going to require some more education to do that, and so. We have to, it's a culture issue that we have to get students and parents to understand that to get X amount of money and earn a living wage means I have to do at least two years of college or more. Yeah, I mean, also, I, can I just, one, one thing our survey also found was that uh, people uh, who are um, not college graduates were most likely to say a college a degree is necessary for success. So these are people who are facing the realities of a labor market that does not reward very well people who don't have any college um, certificate or, or degree. Um, and one of the other issues was affordability. A lot of students and their parents do not think that college is affordable. They don't know uh, that, um, for example, about Cal Grants or, or Pell Grants. How, how would they when they're, you know, they're eight or ninth graders and uh, parents who, in, in many cases, uh, haven't been to college themselves? Yeah, I think as well, aren't you? I just think as well, one of the things that's surprising to me, we just did a study of where students get advising in college, who they go to, and I would have guessed from faculty members, um, the actual reality is most of them say from their mother and father. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're first generation, you're already fumbling with that, and are we active enough in educating families mm -hmm. about the value of education? And, and I, I hear the arguments. But are they persuasive, and, and do they really um, bear on facts that we can gain in order to create a, 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 per, a persuasive and pervasive argument? I touched on it a little bit in my previous response, um, which is that you know I'm afraid that until we figure out how to um, shift the language around A to G, um, that it's just a battle that um, has no end. Um, um, you know, if I can personalize this a little bit, when you understand how to navigate these complex systems, right? Um, my daughter, um, who's 16, um, she uh, is in, in, in an engineering pathway, right? And that engineering pathway, for all intents and purposes, I mean, will get her A to G, all the A to G courses. Um, and she probably has no idea about the difference between A to G and CTE and all of that stuff, right? That's, that's what we need to work toward. I think my, my hope, which is why I think we need to monitor um, the implementation, not of the California school dashboard, I mean, people are going to get greens, reds, yellows, and all of that stuff. It's how are we going to, as, as K-12, as a system, work toward going from red to orange to yellow uh, to eventually blue in the college and career readiness metric. Um, and so if we can figure out a way where we begin to talk more about the college and career readiness standard as opposed to A to G or CTE or vocational, then I think uh, that is sort of my, 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 my current hope, um, that we shift away from um, A to G or, or, or pathways or CTE and, and we monitor um, and find some best practices for um, systems that are actually moving students uh, into a category of MET standard uh, in college and career readiness, but not because they're already in a CTE pathway um, or, or just because they're already um, on track to complete A to G. But that is, those that are on track to complete A to G are then exposed to CTE pathways. Those that are in a CTE pathway move toward a more robust pathway that also produces students completing A to G without them even understanding the difference or having to ask a counselor, well, but you know, my dad said that he, I needed to take A to G courses, so I, I kind of want an engineering pathway, but is it an A to G approved course? I mean, students shouldn't be burdened with that kind of responsibility. So PPIC will continue to be engaged in these topics, as I know uh, you all are on a day-to-day -day basis in, in your work lives. I very much appreciate 
uh, each of you taking time out of your busy schedules to provide us with a very rich and informative and fact-based conversation. So please uh, join me in, in thanking our panel. And we are adjourned. Nice to see you. Yeah, thanks.